We would like to thank the following for making this production possible. Mary Jane Brock and the Sierra Club Foundation. When the first white adventurers struggled across these mountains in California in the 1830s, they were not prepared for what they found here. Already they had seen astonishing prairies and deserts, vast canyons, strange plants and animals unknown to science and to ordinary folk back east. Now in this last westernmost range, they encountered one more surprise, an ancient race of giants. Like the mysterious giants mentioned in the Bible, they seemed far larger than life. In reality, they were and are the largest trees on Earth, the giant sequoias. From a quarter inch seed embedded in a cone, a sequoia can grow to a height of over 300 feet, as high as a 30-story building. At the base, its trunk can swell up to 40 feet in diameter. Sequoias also are among the oldest living things, some older than 3,000 years. A century ago, the legendary writer conservationist John Muir, a founder of the Sierra Club, dubbed these massive trees gods of the woods. Sequoias live in 75 small, isolated groves along the Sierra Nevada. Like the ferns that often grow at their feet, sequoias need a cool, moist climate. Suitable conditions are found only on the west slope of the range, mostly at elevations from 5,000 to 7,000 feet. Sequoia groves are not pure, but include trees of several other species. Rivulets fed by melting snow run through the groves, supplying water in the warmer, drier months. Many animals make their homes in, among, and under the big trees. For the black bear, the slow decay on the ground floor of a grove makes a kind of cafeteria. Here he finds a meal of insect larvae lodged in rotting logs. Most grove soils are granitic, formed partly of decomposed granite rock. Sequoia seeds require mineral soils for rooting and growth. Despite their daunting size, sequoias struggle. The sequoia at left has wrapped its base around a cedar, making its massive trunk more stable. A giant that has stood for millennia can fall in a moment, victim of a storm or long overdue fire. In nature, nothing is assured. Plants like the California fuchsia require full sunlight and can thrive in sunny openings in and around a grove. The aspen, too, needs full sun to reproduce and is found in the forest surrounding the grove. The sequoia as a species is adapted to the company it keeps and to the natural cycles of water, wind, and fire. The seasons of the year assault it, then assuage it. Of all the forces that bear on this race of giants, only one has posed a real danger. For countless centuries, humankind has impacted the sequoia groves. To the Native American, the sequoia was one of the pillars of his home in the natural world. But to the peoples who settled here later, it was too often seen as a mammoth source of raw materials as so many logs ready to be felled and cut.
To the lumberman, the giant sequoia must have looked too good to be true. And as experience would prove, it was. The trees were supremely difficult to cut, carry, and convert into something useful. Tens of thousands of fence posts could be cut from a single tree, enough to fence over 20 square miles of land. But fence posts, shingles, and a few trinkets were about all the wood was good for. It proved too brittle for construction work. When felled, the huge trunks often broke to bits on hitting the ground, wasting up to three-fourths of the wood. Nonetheless, the era of sequoia logging persisted off and on from the 1850s through the 1950s. By the end, a tragic one-fourth of the total sequoia acreage had been cut. But the sequoias have always had their champions, even in the early days. John Muir, sickened by the stump fields, warned that in a few decades nothing would be left but a few hacked and scarred monuments. In 1890, the Sequoia National Park was established, saving many groves from devastation by commercial logging. Other groves became part of a new national forest in 1908. On these new park and forest lands, a primary goal was to protect the venerable groves from the threat of fire. In Sequoia National Park, wildfires were heroically fought and extinguished for 80 years. In official ease, all fire was excluded. People thronged to the park to gaze at such giants as the General Grant tree, weighing an estimated 1,250 tons. And yet, in the long run, this common-sense fire exclusion policy would do more harm than good. However well meant, it was fatally flawed. Fire was a force of nature to which the groves were well adapted. Most of the biggest, sturdiest sequoias bore fire scars many centuries old. They had endured a long series of fires and lived to tell about it. Now, artificial fire exclusion was changing everything. In 1968, Sequoia National Park decided to reintroduce fire. But in the Sequoia National Forest, fire exclusion continued. What exactly are the problems caused by keeping fire out? In a sequoia grove without fire for several decades, fallen trees and limbs accumulate on the forest floor. As it builds up and dries out, this woody litter, called fuel, can easily catch fire. Under natural conditions, fire usually occurs often enough to consume this fuel before the buildup is great. Lightning fires are common, and Native Americans would set fires to increase production of wild plants that game animals feed on. But when fire is excluded, fuel builds to dangerous levels. Also, thick leaf litter and other organic debris on the forest floor covers up the mineral soil that sequoia seedlings need for growth. And without periodic fire, too many young cedars, firs, and other trees can take root and grow, cutting off the sunlight vital to young sequoias. As these other trees grow taller, they become deadly ladder fuel, allowing ground fires to climb higher and scorch the crowns of nearby sequoias, severely injuring or killing them. The longer fire is excluded, the greater the danger of an extremely hot and deadly fire, difficult or impossible to control. Sequoia bark is not seriously damaged by periodic fires under natural conditions. But a fire that starts after decades of exclusion can burn right through and consume the wood of the trunk. 